believe that whites at the local level, whether in the states or federal territories, that they had the right to decide whether slavery would expand or diminish in the United States without interference from Congress. So under this definition of popular sovereignty, slavery's future would be determined not by a majority of all American citizens, but by a very small majority of the settlers who went to live in the Western territories. In reference to the enslavement of black people out West, Douglas had said, I don't care whether it be voted up or down. This indicated to Lincoln that the greatest obstacle to reducing and eventually getting rid of slavery in the United States was Douglas teaching white Northerners to become indifferent to the plight of black people in the federal territories. And this is how Lincoln put it. They tell us that they desire the people of a territory to vote slavery out or in as they please. The question arises, slavery or freedom? Caring nothing about it, they let it come in. And that is the end of it. It is the surest way of nationalizing the institution, just as certain, but more dangerous because more insidious. But it is leading us there just as certainly and as surely as Jeff Davis would have us go. What made Douglas's don't care policy in the territories so insidious to Lincoln was that for slavery to become national, no politician north of the Mason-Dixon line needed to argue in favor of slavery. Following Douglas, simply get white Americans in the free states not to care if black slavery expanded into federal territory. Once slavery was accepted as a constitutional right in that territory, it would soon become legal in all the free states, regardless of what those laws or constitutions of those states said. In his debates with Stephen Douglas in 1858, Lincoln warned that popular sovereignty, coupled with the recent Dred Scott decision in 1857, would produce precisely this outcome in the not too distant future. Remarkably, in Illinois, where Blacks possessed very few civil rights and no political rights, Lincoln consistently stood up for their possession of natural rights. Where Douglas was emphatic in reading Black people out of the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln believed it included, in principle, Black people, all people, everywhere. Tempted by Douglas to stray from its original commitment to human equality, America was becoming a country Lincoln no longer recognized. And this is in the mid to late 1850s. So what he did is he called upon our ancient faith, as he put it, to guide the country back to its noblest ideals and practices. Looking back to the founders, couldn't have been more relevant to the crisis the nation faced in the 1850s. But appealing to the founders was something that Senator Stephen Douglas also did. He was not only Lincoln's rival, but also the leading Democrat, and therefore, in my opinion, the leading politician of the 1850s throughout that decade. And he claimed he knew better than Lincoln what the founders thought about the question, about the future of slavery on American soil. Douglas claimed that his policy aligned more closely with the founders' intentions for the new republic. In Lincoln's mind, the future of freedom and the eventual demise of slavery depended on whose reading of the founders was correct and could best unite a divided country. Lincoln argued that at the founding of the United States, slavery was viewed and treated as a necessary evil but it had become in the slaveholding states, to quote South Carolina Senator John C. Calhoun, a positive good. The founders also agreed, according to Lincoln, that where slavery already existed in the states, Congress would have no authority over that institution because of the federal nature of the United States Constitution. Slavery was considered a domestic, domestic institution and therefore governed mostly by state authority. Since the beginning of the United States, the powers of government were divided between the state governments on the one hand and on the other hand, the national government. 
because slavery existed prior to the formation of the United States, it wasn't introduced by the United States, it was a pre-existing condition, if you will, it remained a state institution. If the states themselves didn't abolish it, it could not be abolished by Congress short of a constitutional amendment, and then, of course, followed by ratification by the states. With the population growing faster in the free states than in the slaveholding states, the future of slavery in America would be decided by the votes of white Northerners. Lincoln believed that Congress did have authority to ban slavery in the, the only land possessed by the American people at large, and that's the federal territories. However, tempted by Stephen Douglas's so-called popular sovereignty, slavery's, pay, slavery's fate might be determined not by moral right, but by mere self-interest, meaning those who could profit by taking black slaves into the federal territories. But if white Northerners agreed with Douglas that Congress did not have authority to regulate the domestic affairs of the territories, then his declared indifference would actually represent, according to Lincoln, over real zeal for the spread of slavery. And so Lincoln was at pains to tie the future security of the rights of white people to the present insecurity of the rights of black people. Those same white Americans would have to decide if what happened to people who did not look like them, enslaved blacks in the South, potentially being taken into federal territory, did this have anything to do with the kind of country in which they wanted to live? For Lincoln, the necessary connection could be found not only in the thinking, but also the practice of the American founders. A case in point, when the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 opened both territories north of the 3630 parallel to the possibility of slavery, it contradicted the Missouri Compromise of 1820, which had banned slavery from that very territory. That was part of the compromise. That was part of the bargain. Lincoln pointed out that the founding generation, as well as generations that followed soon after in the early republic, they acted to restrict the expansion of slavery in the United States. They did so by banning slavery from the only territory that they possessed at the time, the Northwest Territory, and they did that in 1787. And they also stopped the importation of slaves on January 1st, 1808, all in hopes of putting slavery, as Lincoln said, in the course of ultimate extinction. Lincoln lamented how the nation had departed from its original approach to abolishing this pre-existing institution, slavery, in a peaceful and gradual manner. And these are Lincoln's words. The plain, unmistakable spirit of that age towards slavery was hostility to the principle and toleration only by necessity. But now it is to be transformed into a sacred right. Nebraska brings it forth, places it on the high road to extension and perpetuity. Little by little, but steadily as man's march to the grave, we have been giving up the old for the new faith. This new faith was Douglas's perversion of true popular sovereignty. His was a crude majoritarianism. It rejected the self-evident truth that all men are created equal and made the rights of black people depend on the arbitrary will of local white majorities. Lincoln rejected this legal positivism, and he preached a return to what he called our ancient faith, the faith of the fathers. Our Republican, soil, our Republican robe is soiled and trailed in the dust, Lincoln declared. Let us repurify it. Let us turn and wash it white in the spirit, if not the blood of the revolution. Let us turn slavery from its claims of moral right back upon its existing legal rights and its arguments of necessity. Let us return it to the position our fathers gave it, and there let it rest in peace." Nice pun. Lincoln charged Americans to re-adopt the Declaration of Independence. In so doing, they would not only have saved the Union, but so saved it as to make and to keep it forever worthy of the saving. That was in October of 1854 when Lincoln spoke those words. 
A country worthy of the saving needed to be a country that limited the expansion of slavery as a first step to its eventual death. In short, a don't care policy was not worthy of Lincoln's generation of Americans because it was not worthy of the fathers of the American Republic. In December of 1860, President-elect Abraham Lincoln received a letter from none other than Alexander Stevens. He would soon become the Vice President of the Confederate States of America. In December, Stevens wanted Lincoln to speak to the nation before his March 4th inauguration. In Stevens's words, to save our common country. Quoting Proverbs 25, Stevens suggested to Lincoln that a word fitly spoken by you now would be like apples of gold in pictures of silver. This prompted Lincoln to jot a note to himself, a reflection on what he called the philosophical cause of American prosperity. For someone who had long revered the Constitution and saw the union of the American states as essential, vital to the success of the Republic, Lincoln wrote, quote, even these, Constitution and Union, are not the primary cause of our great prosperity. He continued, there is something back of these entwining itself more closely about the human heart. That something is the principle of liberty to all, the principle that clears the path for all, gives hope to all, and by consequence, enterprise and industry to all. And then Lincoln quoted that proverb that Stevens had cited. The assertion of that principle at that time was the word fitly spoken, which has proved an apple of gold to us. The union and the constitution are the picture of silver subsequently framed around it. The picture was made not to conceal or destroy the apple, but to adorn and preserve it. The picture was made for the apple, not the apple for the picture. What the country needed was not a new word from their new president, Lincoln thought, but old words, the words of their forefathers expressed in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln saw the Declaration's principle of liberty to all, the equal rights possessed by all human beings. He saw that as the moral compass of a constitution and union that could otherwise be misinterpreted or even broken in pursuit of tyrannical ends. A year before he was elected president, Lincoln was asked to give a speech in Boston on the anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's death. Uh, I'm sorry, on the anniversary of Thomas Jefferson's birth. Lincoln couldn't make the trip, but he sent a letter that was essentially an ode to Jefferson's achievement in drafting the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln wrote that the principles, uh, the principles of Jefferson are the definitions and axioms of free society. For someone who studied Euclid's geometry while in Congress, Lincoln was referring to the Declaration's principles as the building blocks of democracy. Unfortunately, even self-evident truths, Lincoln admitted, can be denied and evaded as was the case when he wrote that letter in 1859. Lincoln said, this is a world of compensations. He who would be no slave must consent to have no slave. Alluding to Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, Lincoln observed that those who deny freedom for others deserve it not for themselves and under a just God cannot long retain it. These were astounding words for Lincoln, the Republican and former Whig, to utter, given the success that states' rights Democrats achieved in donning the mantle of Jefferson, one of the founders of the Democratic Party. Still, Lincoln declared all honor to Jefferson, to the man who, in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people, had the coolness forecast and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth applicable to all men and all times. And so to embalm it there that today and in all coming days, 
it shall be a rebuke and a stumbling block to the very harbingers of reappearing tyranny and oppression. In looking back to Jefferson, Lincoln looked back to a founding generation that put the principles of civil society and legitimate government in writing. Principles he believed applied in his day and obligated Americans to renew their commitment to eliminating slavery as fast as circumstances should permit. Lincoln's anti-slavery convictions were in fact the very thing that informed his devotion to the Constitution. Like the founders, Lincoln believed that but for the American Union, there would be no freedom for white people or black people. This was no innovation on Lincoln's part, but rather the abiding conviction of Americans who knew their colonial and revolutionary history. Liberty required political independence from foreign powers, and independence required unity among the American colonies. To maintain that American Union required compromises be made, especially regarding slavery. Here's Lincoln's words. I think that was the condition in which we found ourselves when we established this government. We had slavery among us. We could not get our constitution unless we permitted them to remain in slavery. We could not secure the good we did secure if we grasped for more. And having by necessity submitted to that much, it does not destroy the principle that is the charter of our liberties. Time and again, Lincoln's references to the founders centered on how they tried to establish a government based on human equality, but by that very equality imposed upon themselves a moral necessity to abolish slavery in a manner consistent with the consent that was, as I think of it, the flip side of the equality coin. Lincoln put it this way, late in the war, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. And yet I have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. This distinction between official duty and personal wish, a distinction Lincoln made most famously in his 1862 public letter to Horace Greeley, before he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, this distinction demonstrates most clearly Lincoln's concern that Americans follow the rule of law in their pursuit of justice, in their pursuit of equality and liberty. With the draft of the Emancipation Proclamation already in his pocket, Lincoln wrote this to Greeley in a uh, uh, newspaper. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. In America, the means of securing liberty needs to be consistent with the end. To emancipate slaves as president in a time of war, Lincoln had to turn a humanitarian end into a constitutional means. This way, emancipation would not only be an act of justice, but also an act, as the proclamation put it, warranted by the constitution upon military necessity. Lincoln sought to make both his means and his ends a faithful expression of the consent of the American people. Lincoln became the greatest defender of the founders, not merely because he fought successfully to preserve the American Union, but also because he explained why America was worth preserving. In looking to the founders, he believed Americans could learn the true principles of self-government and thus find common ground for promoting a common future as a truly self-governing people. Lincoln belongs to the ages as a teacher of profound lessons regarding the means and ends of American self-government, as well as the challenge of living as a free people. In Lincoln's speeches and writings, Americans today, I believe, can learn how exceptional their country really is, 
or at least can be, and therefore why Lincoln called the United States the last best hope of the earth. Thank you. You're muted. Yeah, can't there believe I'm not getting that. I know. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, again, this is his book, Lincoln and the American Founding. Uh, and there's a lot of questions in the chat box, Lucas, uh, that are going to be coming in. So uh, that I'll be reading to you, but I'll start with the first one. The rest of you go ahead and keep putting your questions in there. One question I have, Lucas, is there is this focus of Lincoln on getting right with the founders and on the past. Yet at the same time, he's very much a politician that looks towards the future quite optimistically, it seems to me. And so could you elaborate on that a little bit more for our audience? Sure. Because it, it, he's not just someone who's looking to, to the past, but he's looking very much to the future. So talk, talk about that a little bit. I, th I think this is one of those cases where Lincoln was preaching what he had already practiced, what he had already experienced as uh, you know, backwoods frontiersmen. I mean, he actually put in a campaign autobiography that his father could bunglingly <laughs> write his name. I mean, who says that about his own dad? Now we know that they had a, a fairly tense relationship, but uh, Lincoln was essentially saying, look, where I grew up, there was very little incentive for anybody to get any advanced training or education, especially education. Lincoln said that he learned by littles. He had a grand total of maybe 12 months of formal education at what he called blab schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that little house on the prairie, one room, you know, the, the schoolhouse with all the grades put in it. Um, back then you were, you, were, you were living hand to mouth and that, that reading, writing, and arithmetic stuff didn't just seem very practical. But honestly, what made Lincoln a Whig and then turn Republican was this idea that if government provided the appropriate infrastructure, that would give people tremendously, you know, variety, a variety, a tremendously, uh, a, a tremendous variety of ways that they could figure out what they did and did well that they could actually bring to market, either by way of a service or some kind of good. And so Lincoln thought, wow, in a country where your last name isn't held against you, now race, of course, is held against you. That is the tremendous um, exception in this case. But for the vast majority of the population, which was white, Lincoln said, there's really nothing holding you back in this country if there was the infrastructure there and education there for anyone who applied themselves. And Lincoln, remember, this is a guy who grew up on the farm. What was he going to do for a living? What his dad did? Well, Lincoln learned two things. He's strong enough to, to be a farmer. But secondly, he didn't want anything to do with that kind of backbreaking <laughs> labor and honestly labor that may not prove fruitful if the rain didn't come. It was highly contingent on forces you were not in control of. Lincoln wanted to be in control of his fate. And at least in this country, he thought if you applied yourself and you took to those books, he didn't need high school. He didn't need college, let alone a law, a law school education to learn how to do other things in life he figured out he could cultivate his brain, be ultimately became a lawyer and then politician, and just marveled at the fact that a country like this could allow someone to come from such a poor background and elevate himself ultimately to a place where he would, I think we would say, is at least middle or upper middle class. Um, he had a stepbrother uh, who had the same opportunities as he did and was essentially a ne'er-do-well. Um, Lincoln once wrote to him and said, you know what, I, after the guy kept asking him for another loan that he wasn't going to pay back, he said, I don't want to call you lazy, but you doesn't seem like you, you really like to work. <laughs> and so Lincoln thought in this country, for those who want to work, those who want to apply themselves, he said, the key was what the founders established. Let's begin with the basics. Let's have everybody start with what they already have in common and possess by nature, which is equality, equal possession of rights, equal liberty. And if the laws are equal, then the world is your oyster. Uh, they didn't use the word equal opportunity the way we did today, the way we do today, but the, the, the phrase they would use is a fair chance, a fair chance. 
And Lincoln said, unlike any other nation in the world, America offered that fair chance. He benefited, profited from that, prospered from it, and he prospered from it and could link it to what he saw in the Declaration of Independence. So that old idea, which was a fair, it was a fairly rare one. No other country lived that way. And Lincoln thought, wow, this is the key to America's progress and prosperity. Um, in that way, uh, it, he wasn't just being nostalgic about our revolutionary fathers. He thought it was the, the, the vital element that produced prosperity in his own life, and he thought could produce prosperity in the lives of others. Okay, Lucas, this next question is actually a couple of questions, but uh, they're good ones, and I doubt there'll be any surprise to you. Uh, the question is from Andrew. How do these ideas that America's past could help bring about a better future relate to today's cancel culture? Is it smart to remove monuments, books, etc., which represent a past we do not agree with? Would it be better for our country if we look back at these monuments and learn from the mistakes of our past, or should we take down these types of monuments altogether? All right, that's uh, two questions in principle, three literally. Let's see what I can do with that. Um, I teach at a university named after two slaveholders, George Washington and Robert E. Lee. Uh, right now we are, um, we are trying to figure out who we are in relation to those men who are the most pivotal men in the development of our school. Uh, so yeah, we've been wrestling with memory for a while at Washington and Lee. Uh, we're actually thinking of, uh, trustees are actually wrestling with whether they should remove Lee's name from uh, the namesake of the university, uh, from the university. I'll speak to the monuments thing first. It's always been at least clear to me that the reason you put monuments up are the reasons you take them down. In other words, if the reason you put them up to begin with was because you thought these individuals did great things worthy of remembering, not just good things, but truly momentous things, uh, things that you wanted to live past that person and past that current generation. Well, what if it's the case that the reason why you honor them is no longer true or perhaps was never valid, perhaps, uh, especially in this country, was in fact inconsistent with the fundamental principles of the regime, namely equality and liberty, as I put it, as Lincoln put it, as Jefferson put it. Um, I don't see any problem with today's generation saying, wow, that Georgia or Mississippi flag doesn't really represent all Georgians. We need a flag that represents all Mississippians. I don't see, I don't think that there's any problem with them through a deliberative process, a fair process where we hear both sides of the argument say, gee, I wonder why that flag is designed that way. What did it mean to those people? And what has it meant to some other people all this time? And in our increasingly diverse time, shouldn't we have buildings named after folks, monuments erected to folks who do reflect the common wheel, the common good, the common wealth of all of a particular society, be it a city, a state, or a nation. Now, does that mean we take down all the monuments, for example, to Confederates? I would not be in favor of that. And I'm a union guy. Um, monuments, of course, on battlefields and cemeteries for me um, are, are a different category. And if I gave a speech on monuments and memorials, uh, we could spend more time on it. But essentially, I would say, with a few key exceptions, these names and these memorials, statues, plaques, whatever, that are on public property, I think should represent all of the public. And that I don't think we should destroy these things. Um, we've got museums, we've got plenty of places that they, we can mark those, honor those. In some cases, these are um, expressions of, of great art and artists. Um, and so I don't think we should be iconoclasts in our approach to them. But I do think um, it, uh, I, I, I think it is being obscurantist to pretend that certain Confederate monuments don't and were not intended to signal a certain thing to black people and racial minorities. And, you know, we should just leave them up, you know, for historical sakes. I don't think those people are being uh, completely honest uh, who make that argument. I don't think they're being fair and I don't think they're being capacious enough. Um, I, I would apply the golden rule here, right? If you're a white person, pretend you're a black person and you have to pass by 
a monument like that on state grounds or city hall grounds, et cetera, what is that monument telling you now if you were in their position? And so I would, I would apply that rule to um, uh, public monuments and memorials. You know, if the reason you put them up no longer exists, then through an orderly deliberative process, uh, take it down. Okay, Lucas, thank you for that. The next, the next question is from Leslie. I believe this is one of my students. And she'd like for you to talk a little bit more about the morality of emancipation. Sure. And, and do you see an instance where Lincoln maybe would not have issued the Emancipation Proclamation? Excellent question. It's one that I wrestle with um, with my students when I teach a seminar on Lincoln every year. In that public letter to Greeley, it was you know the closest thing we had to press releases back then. You know, uh, uh, Greeley had complained that Lincoln was not doing enough to enforce the Confiscation Acts, uh, two of them, by Congress in '61 and '62. As I mentioned, Lincoln had already drafted an Emancipation Proclamation, but was persuaded by his cabinet to wait to issue it. Uh, until a time where it looked like he could actually put teeth into the bite of that uh, military order. In other words, we needed to wait for a Union victory, and arguably that victory was the Battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg, depending on how you think of it. So a month later, after his letter to Greeley, he actually issues the proclamation. Now, um, in that very letter, Lincoln spells out the three approaches he would take to slavery under the, the, the more fundamental context of his authority as president to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So he took something uncontroversial, which was, uh, at least to Northerners, uh, uh, to defend the Union, right? Every American expects a president to do that. He's the commander in chief, not debatable. The question is, what means can he use? That's up to his discretion in, in, in large measure. And so he said in that very letter, if I could preserve the union without freeing a single slave, even though morally that would be just, constitutionally, Lincoln thought it would not be legitimate. That in other words, that the American people did not delegate to the president plenary authority to do good in the world. No, 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 no. Especially one person to have that kind of authority. We're gonna limit your term. We're gonna state what your roles are. And in a few cases, your actual powers. And so Lincoln thought, even though his personal wish was that all men everywhere should be free, that's his literal bottom line in the Horace Greeley letter, he said, what I am trying to save is a constitutional way of life. And so it's not enough to say I'm going to do moral things or what I simply think is moral. I have to justify it as a legitimate expression of the delegated authority, the power that people actually gave me in good faith as their executive. So in a time of war, what did he actually do? Actually, in a time of peace on March 4th, 1861, Lincoln's inauguration speech, he says, I'm not gonna touch slavery where it already exists. I'm on record back in 58 and the Republican party at which I am the head also says the same thing. We cannot touch slavery where it already exists in the States, okay? So for a while, Lincoln did try to preserve the union without freeing a single slave. That was all the way up through December 31st, 1862. What did he do on January 1st? He freed slaves in those areas that he considered under, still under rebellion. They had been warned 100 days earlier on September 22nd, preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, that, hey, if you don't come back into the Union, if you don't send guys back into Congress showing that you are obeying and abiding by the United States Constitution, then I am going to treat you as if you are still in rebellion, resisting federal authority, and I'm going to issue a proclamation, a military order, a proclamation of emancipation to those legally enslaved in your states. That didn't apply to Delaware, to Kentucky, to Missouri, to Maryland, because those citizens of those states were still loyal to the Union, and as president, he was bound to enforce, among other things, the Fugitive Slave Act. That was in the Constitution, too. Well, when did Lincoln actually free all the slaves? Well, Lincoln didn't free all the slaves, but Daniel Day Lewis did lobby, ha ha ha, for passage of the 13th <laughs> Amendment. Yes, he deserved that Oscar. Lincoln lobbied because he didn't have any authority in terms of the Constitution's amendment process. He lobbied very hard 
to get Congress at that point in time, it would have been the House. The Senate had passed it already in 64. He lobbied to get them to pass the 13th Amendment, which didn't just free slaves, it actually abolished the institution. Lincoln actually went so far as to put his name on the constitutional uh, amendment and Congress reminded him, hey, uh, presidents don't sign amendments, but Lincoln wanted his name attached to that. So in that very letter, the three things he said he would do vis-a-vis -vis slavery in relation to the preservation of the union, Lincoln as president did all three. My point and why this is a long-winded answer is to demonstrate that Lincoln was trying to show the country that it wasn't just a physical protection that he was fighting for. He was fighting for a, a constitutional way of life, a rule of law way of life, a deliberative a government by consent way of life. How we pursue justice is as important as that justice itself. And so if we're gonna free slaves, Lincoln wanted to do it in a way that would be not subject to a, a Supreme Court uh, attack, uh, attack with a Supreme Court ruling, and Justice Taney, Chief Justice Taney, the Taney of Dred Scott opinion, 1857, he was on the court until October of, of 1864. Lincoln was not sure whether Emancipation Proclamation um, would be held constitutional by the court. That would be a problem for him, a problem he wanted to avoid. Uh, and so it's 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 saving a constitutional way of life at the end of the game, at the end of the day, in my opinion. That, that Lincoln weds or joins to the concern for justice and morality. Okay, the next question is, this is kind of a question about how history happens in a way. This is from uh, Lewis. And he wants to want you to talk a little bit about Lincoln's centrality to the abolition of slavery. In other words, had Lincoln not lived, when would the United States have ended slavery? England had ended Ooh. it in the 1830s. Uh, so, you know, what discuss his centrality to it. Uh, it's interesting you, the, the questioner used the word centrality. Lincoln well, was quoted as a phrase. That's more my phrase. Uh, okay, well, well, I like that phrase, John, because uh, as you well know, Lincoln once said that if, if he is going to be known for anything, remembered for anything after he's long gone, he says, it will be emancipation. He says it would. It, it is going to be considered, quote, the central act of my administration, end quote. Um, and of course, to say that it's the central act uh, points to him as the central actor. Uh, let me put it to you this way. And this is, you know, I'm writing a book right now on Lincoln and race. I call it Lincoln, race and the fragile American Republic. And one, one of my arguments is going to be, or one thing I'm gonna point out, something that we don't slow down enough to appreciate is, had Lincoln not won, in 1860, the presidency, what would that have said about the character of the American people and their understanding of the Constitution and the requirements of that Constitution to promote justice? We would have taken a path either in favor of the Breckinridge Democrats or the Douglas Democrats, neither of which intended for slavery to be abolished in any time soon. Douglas famously said, hey, we were a nation born diverse in terms of slavery and freedom. We can live, you know, ad infinitum in, in, in perpetuity that way. Lincoln said, no, 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 we can't live as a house divided. Breckinridge and the, the Southern Democrats wanted slavery legal everywhere. And so what would have happened is, notice what I'm trying to link here. It's not just Lincoln, a man or a politician. If he's not elected, that is a reflection of the American people their moral character and their constitutional self-understanding. Had they rejected the Republican platform, if you will, or Lincoln's politics, what they would have chosen is either a pro-slavery future in the short run or voting for Douglas, a pro-slavery future through yeah. indifference in the yeah. long run. America was not anywhere near putting slavery in the course of ultimate extinction. Lincoln was the one who said, I don't like the direction we're going. 1854 Kansas, Nebraska Act, 1857 Dred Scott opinion. He says, we're going in the wrong way. We are departing from the ancient faith. We're moving away from my understanding of the original intention of Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison, et cetera. And that he said, that's worth putting on the political table. And ultimately, 
finally calling the South on their bluff to secede, something they've been, been, been spewing for over a decade. He says, this is worth Americans fighting for to prevent their country from becoming one they would not recognize. And so I, I think that was it was momentous, not just because of who Lincoln was and, 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 the, and his leadership, his statesmanship, the way forward, um, he pointed out by asking us to readopt the declaration. It was also a, a, re a referendum on our own understanding of freedom and self-government. It was a constitutional gut check and um, it proved pivotal. Yeah, but not just an election, right? There were people who didn't want to abide by the ele election. And therefore, we had to figure out, were we going to be a people willing to shoot destroyers or uh, those attempting to destroy what Lincoln was trying to save? And thankfully, in my opinion, we chose wisely. Okay, this next question is <clears throat> really kind of related to that point you just brought out. Um, can you talk a little bit about Lincoln's awareness of George Fitzhugh's writings and, oh. Fitzhugh's, and Fitzhugh's argument that slavery was the natural condition of those who labored, regardless of race, and should therefore be extended nationwide to include whites as well as as well as blacks? Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize the the, the nature of that. So, could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, George Fitzhugh was a guy who wrote uh, two key books. I'm sure he wrote more things. I'm not a student of Fitzhugh, but I've, I've read Fitzhugh. He wrote one called Cannibals All and another one called Sociology for the South. And he, he argued, his thesis was as, exactly as you, as you put it. It was, he didn't think there was one person in 20 who could actually rule himself uh, well. And, and this was regardless of race. And so he thought most people did not deserve to live uh, according to their own moral lights. He was not a believer in government by consent of the governed. Uh, to the question, was Lincoln aware of George Fitzhugh? I'm not, I, I'm going to speculate here. I don't recall seeing that name come up in any of his writings. I'm going to speculate that he was, he wasn't directly aware of Fitzhugh. He wasn't a reader of philosophy. Not that Fitzhugh is a philosopher, but Lincoln was more into political economy. Um, and, and American history, and of course, Shakespeare and the poetry of Robert Burns and the Bible. Um, so, but, but more importantly, I don't think that Lincoln needed to read Fitzhugh to understand that there were arguments out there flatly contradicting and denying his interpretation of the Declaration of Independence and its statements with regards to self-evident truths, the fundamental one being human equality, the fundamental one being that we are all in equal possession of the rights of nature as human beings. We're equally human, uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And because of that, you can't tell anybody what to do without their permission, government by consent. And so um, I, I think, as I put it in, in my speech, um, for Lincoln, um, I mean, a flat rejection of the positive good thesis that was made most famous by John C. Calhoun in an 1837 speech on the floor of the Senate, uh, it's not a necessary evil, it's a positive good for the slave and for the, the master. Uh, for Lincoln, as bad as that argument was, and as a flat contradiction of the declaration it was, that wasn't what most troubled him. What most troubled him was the idea of racial superiority, a white supremacy becoming, uh, moving from a de facto to a de jure, an informal to a politically formal official position of the government and therefore an expression of most Americans uh, thinking. Lincoln did not believe that expressed most Americans thinking. Here's, here's, a, here, here's an example. Lincoln's elected in November of 1860. December, Stephen Douglas on Christmas Eve day, he proposes two amendments. They're called articles to the constitution, a 13th amendment and a 14th amendment. You know what the 14th amendment said in its very first clause first section, it said, and imagine if this, if the American people agreed to this, Douglas thought that to, to preserve the American Union, maybe we ought to make white supremacy a constitutional policy. And so his first section, first clause of the 14th Amendment didn't say anything about equal protection, due process, privileges or immunities. You know what it said? It said, no black person can vote in any election 
anywhere in the United States, city, state, national, or territory, nor can any black person hold political office at any political level or jurisdiction. Here was rank white supremacy by a guy who didn't care whether slavery expanded into the federal territories. He proposed that as a way to preserve the union. Lincoln said, that's not a country I recognize. That's not the country that the founders wanted to come to fruition on the basis of the principles laid out in the declaration. So I hope that in some form or fashion addresses uh, that question about Fitzhugh. No, it does, uh, it does. We're about out, we're pretty much out of time, uh, Lucas. Uh, and we're, someone just sent in and said, where do we get the text of that uh, amendment of Douglas's? That oh, 14th, um, that proposed 14th John, amendment. Uh, Professor, how about I send it to you? I can send you a screenshot of it because uh, it's actually kind of hard to get. Um, I can't send you quickly to a website, but I've I've done screenshots of it and I'll send it to you. And if people are interested, talk to Professor Barr. OK, I'll do that. Well, Lucas, thank you. And I want to recommend that everyone uh, that uh, Lincoln and the American Founding by Lucas Morrill. Uh, it's a great read. And uh, you really get a flavor of Lincoln's own words uh, throughout the book. And that's one of the things that I found most enjoyable about it. I think I'll leave you, Lucas, with a comment of a student uh, that says, I'm so happy that our system and the people of that time, including Lincoln, kept the Douglas's ideas from being put into place. <laughs> Fantastic. I I'll, I'll love ending on that. Yeah, me too. So hang on for a bit, Lucas, and for the rest of you, uh, have a good day. Thank you for coming. Be sure to follow us on social media at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like this video, leave a comment, and hit that subscribe button to be notified about our latest content.